Welcome back to our church remodeling project. Today we are finishing off our countertop. We're going to install a large format counter so that you can install brand new looking stone on top of your old Formica and give your kitchen a really awesome refresh. We're turning this countertop into a gorgeous modern tiled surface. Using 30 by 30 inch tile, Schluter Systems new Rondeck Edge countertop transition tile. Look at this. The wonders of modern chemistry so that we can transition from Formica right into a surface that can be tiled. We're going to install a new sink. We're going to clean up the back as well. But for this week, first thing I got to do before I go anywhere is I got to close up the back. The old Formica countertop um, had an integrated backsplash on it. We ripped that out so that we could go with sleek modern lines. So let me just cut a piece of drywall, get this installed, and then we can move forward. Wouldn't you know it, the only drywall I've got on my job today is not long enough for this. So I'm going to give you a couple of drywall tips and tricks while we're at it today. First tip, when you're cutting drywall, you're only cutting the paper, okay? And then it breaks off every time, no issues. And what we're going to do is we're going to just line this up for the middle of that stud to where I got to cut to. This way I have a joint in the middle of the wall. And then we'll do this one the same, nice and quick. No measuring tape needed. I'm going to tape this later. Not in this video. Okay guys, if you need to know how to drywall, we've got series for all of that. Put in a link in the description for you. Patching and repairing drywall is actually a skill that's very valuable these days. All right, so just a little foreshadowing here. We're gonna be doing a backsplash here and adding some new kitchen cabinets to the top. The backsplash is gonna be really cool though. I'm using a system that doesn't require any thin set, doesn't require a whole lot of tools. You could just cut and install it with a pair of scissors. It's gonna blow your mind. Make sure you subscribe and you don't miss that video. So what we're talking about here is an eight foot, $400 countertop that gives you all the benefits of a natural stone because you can put pots directly on it. I mean, it's a rectified porcelain that I bought and a sleek modern look, right? It is, it's a DIY project. There's a few tricks and tips to this so that you don't have to over order on your material. But first thing we gotta do, I don't wanna cut out our sink because we need to know the end from the beginning before we get moving forward. So let's do that first. It looks like this it even comes with a template, which is gonna be this cardboard. i confirm that with the directions then we can get started. All right. Now, usually, <laughs> normally, um, you can see there's a hole that's in the top of the st stainless steel here, and this is integrated, so you want to cut your countertop like this as well. Give yourself lots of room, because there's always a locking mechanism nut on the underside. You don't want to have anything in the way. So your stone should have this cut. Nice and simple. Let's just have a look at what I bought here. Well, this is a really nice sink, actually. I actually went to try to go to Habitat for Humanity to buy a kitchen sink because you know, this is a simple bar. I didn't have to be too picky. I was like interested in maybe reusing something else, but okay, there we go. Turned out that the 12 sinks that were there just a few days ago were all sold. <sighs> this kind of thing happens. So I went down to the local harbor store and I found out that they only had one sink left. Wouldn't it be the big surprise? It was the most expensive thing that they have on the market. Hurrah. So what we have is stainless steel, heavy gauge. It's even got the spray on the back. It eliminates condensation. That is gonna fit this hole perfectly. All right, let's get our template out. Make sure that it makes sense. Wow. They're leaving us with just a little bit of mercy here, aren't they? Okay, I'm not a big fan of that. Okay, now you'll see here, the template is square, but the edge is rounded. Okay, and the idea here is, these are where these locking pins go. If you've never done a sink before, the hardware goes in here, and it sits inside the hole, and then once you drop it in, it spins around and locks against the underside. So because the hardware isn't going to go in the corner, I'm actually going to cheat with my template. I'm going to trace it out of my countertop. I'm going to round off all my corners. Okay, because I don't want to have a countertop 
that's so close to perfect when I'm cutting natural stone. If I overcut, then I'm gonna have a little gap with grout in it. It's gonna look nasty. So I'm going to just cheat a little bit and put less countertop. So I'm gonna have more countertop in the corner than what they're asking for, knowing that even if I round it out, there's nothing in the way of it, okay? That's just experience talking. Now let's move on with location. There is nothing wrong with having a sink further back, okay? Now, my cabinet has got a lot of meat. I'm four inches from here. I'm five eighths from here. So the framing on the underside is actually four and five eighths. That's how much wood I have under here. I guess the million dollar question is, is it all necessary? Not all of it. I also want to have the sink centered on the door. And then when I install my door, I can center that as well. So that's 10. I can translate that information up here. Let's put a center line on the template. 11 and 3 eighths. And if you're not sure how to do this, when you measure something, you take the full number, you cut that in half, take the fraction, which is 3 eighths, you just double the denominator, the number on the bottom, so 8 goes to 16. So it becomes 11 and 3 16 That's all that is. Put a center mark on that, center mark on that. Line these up. Let's get our sink back as far as we can without making it look too ugly. Remember it's sitting on top of the counter. I think what I'm also going to do is go like this. I'm going to use the square on the template draw a longer line. Okay. Now I can move that line center of my square. I can line this up here knowing I'm going square to everything. I don't have any mercy here. I got gable. I got that and I got framing and I got that. Whew. Wow this really is about almost too perfect for the whole I wish I had options, I would have got something a little smaller. So I got 22 and a quarter inches inside. Yeah, I knew it. This is 22 and 5 eighths. So I'm gonna have this much material underneath that's gonna have to be removed. Not happy, but I have to change my entire plan and put the sink in the middle. At the end of the day, anything that I try to do to fit it over this space, which was the original design, is gonna leave me with a structurally compromised cabinet I'm building a tile countertop after all. I can't, I, can't, I can't compromise the cabinet. I mean, I need, I need to be able to carry the weight and not have things moving around or the grout's gonna crack. It's gonna delaminate from the countertop. I gotta go here. <clears throat> so the good news is my plan for the upper cabinets was to get something from a local building store that's in stock, that's off the shelf, that doesn't change. And that's good. I, um, Sometimes you just got to lick your wounds and move on, right? So we're going to go here. Now we can center this off. All right, we're 27 inches. Center of 27 is 13 and a half. About here. All right. Yay. And center of this template is 11 and 3 eighths. At the end of the day, having a sink off the middle is more balanced. I'm just going to lose a bit of good storage. But that's not going to be the end of the world. So now, let's line this up. Let's line this up. Let's leave enough room back there. Okay. Make sure everything's square. And let's draw out our template. Okay, done. Now we just gotta grab a drill and a jigsaw and we'll cut, we'll cut this out of our way. Drilling some holes, we're gonna see if we even clear this framing back here. Important to take a look at the width of your blade and make sure you're not gonna extend out past where you're working. <laughs> okay, baby. That's right on the wood there. 
Maybe that'll fit. We're gonna we're gonna try to get lucky. Okay, here's a great secret for anybody who's doing this sort of thing. Take a scrap piece of wood, screw it, take it out a little bit so it spins easy. Okay, you can move it out of your way. But when you get right to the last part of the cut, at least this will hold it in position while you finish your cut, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start my jigsaw here, out of the way, work around the back, go like that, and when I'm getting near the end, I can be carrying the weight, and it'll also carry the weight here, okay? And then just before I release it, I'll put that there so that I can be under control. There are times when it's nice to have things under control. Okay, now I need a jigsaw. All right, time for my jigsaw. All right, so here we are. I got a broken blade inside my end, which is why that's not working. Um, things happen. I'm gonna move on and use a combination of two other different tools. I guess the good side is you get to see all the solutions to all the problems you're going to run to if you live the same crazy life like I do. Here we go. Well, that's actually going to work for me. Okay. Let's make, it, let's make a mess. Oh, one thing. I hardly ever wear these things, but when you're messing with Formica, I'm telling you right now, this stuff's unpredictable, and it will slice your eyeball wide open. And like this and like this. There we go. The cool thing about this is the center board here, I have a support, carries the load all the way down, but it also picks up the load, the support going all the way across the back. So now I got gable supports on both sides. All right, now. Here we are. Okay. Now you see how important it is to keep countertop here? Once we're done, we're gonna drill that hole out. And then there will be a structure intact that I can actually tighten my nut to to keep my handle nicely compressed. We're gonna have to pay close attention to that when it comes time to working with the stone. Cut our stone maybe a little bit closer to here, right across this line here. That way it's just a, a simple drill. So step one in doing a tile countertop is have it cut properly straight across and square. That technique was actually in the previous video because we were prepping the cabinet. Make sure you check that out if you haven't. Um, now that we've got this done, it's time to move on to step two. Then of course is to rough up the surface with a light sanding. That's right. <laughs> I didn't get a DeWalt sander. I needed a new one. Last time I used a sander, it was on my fire table and I did it wet and it killed it and I knew that was going to happen, but I picked up this one instead. I was out shopping, I almost got my DeWalt because I love DeWalt tools and I went, wait a second, you're not sponsored by DeWalt. Why don't you just buy the best deal that's on the counter? Turns out this sucker was actually 50 bucks cheaper. Yep, I know. And it comes with this converter here straight to the vacuum. Now, this next part's gonna be a little noisy, but that's because I'm gonna run the vacuum and the sand at the same time. Now, I'm not trying to sand off the finish, I'm just scuffing it up. We're using a multi-surface bonding primer or a latex primer just so that our thin set, our ultralight thin set we're gonna use for the countertop has something to adhere to that's not gonna delimitate. So this is just a mechanical function. It's good to use it. Well, that's brand new. Okay, here we go.
Introducing multi-surface bonding primer. <laughs> um, I'm not selling a product here. There's actually a lot of companies that make a version of this. MAPE makes uh, Eco Prime Grip. I've used that for years as well. I use this right now because it's available at Home Depot and because there's no real online source for the Eco Prime Grip. So trying to use products you can get your hands on. This works great. The idea here is this product is a bonding primer for any two surfaces so they don't delaminate. So you can go tile over vinyl sheet goods if it's glued to concrete, tile over tile, lots of applications. In this case, it's tile over Formica. The reason we sand it is because once you scuff up a surface, a bonding primer has the ability to really get in there and grab it. And this is gonna look really messy and silly and you're like, this is no way this is gonna work. Trust me on this, this stuff is chemistry magic. You don't have to understand how it works. You just got to know that it does. Okay. And really, we're just going to slop it on because, oh, it's so effective. And you want it on every surface, every cut. Don't worry about getting it on the walls. It's not going to hurt anything. Okay. This bonds so well that that one piece of tile I'm using on the countertop is actually structurally sound enough to now add additional strength against deflection. And we're going to run out just add a little bit there. Okay. There we go. I'll just finish this off. And then we're going to have to let this dry. It's going to take about an hour or two. Alrighty then. Basically guys, what's going on here is I'm cutting and installing this trim flush to the edges. I'm doing an overlay in the corner instead of cutting 45s. My tile is actually um, not as thick as this trim. So it's not going to hurt anything to do an overlay. Okay. And this little corner piece just goes like that. All right. Now, the rest of this will be full of cement, and I'm going to travel it, but this little overlay isn't going to matter. It's going to hold everything together for now, so that's awesome. Here we go. Woohoo! Okay, well, I got a chip corner, so I'm definitely going to be cutting that one. <laughs> As you can tell, the tile is really big. Um, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put one here. I've already checked it. The, the sink, where the sink finishes and one tile is actually pretty much the same size. So this is just perfect. I'm going to put one here and then I got to decide how I'm going to do the rest. But I just want to translate my numbers here. Get my numbers. So I want to get my tile cut in advance. And because this is my lead edge because of the chip, I actually have to translate the wrong side. One, four, five eighths. Okay. So we're going to connect the dots, I'm going to cut that down, and I'm going to save the off cut and cut a piece that fills in here. Because of this little piece in the corner, it allows my off cuts to mirror image what's on the top. So that is going to work perfectly. What I want to do is I want to just kind of cut all my stone first. I always call this stone, it's actually porcelain. I'm going to cut it all first and then I'm going to lay it out, make sure that I'm happy with the way it's going to look before I make the cement. Give yourself some work and time, it's nice to do this in advance. When you're doing custom tile, you gotta make a couple of in intelligent decisions. One is my first tile goes underneath my sink lidge. So I'm gonna start the next one in the same location. So I'm 30 inches before I have a grout line, okay? That'll be really good for maintenance. And it'll leave me with a piece here, but I don't care. I'm gonna translate that piece into my grout line on the face of this as well. So it'll be simple. There'll be one grout line somewhere over here and down the front and two little ones here. Works for me, I'll be happy with that. At least this way I'll have a nice big piece of stone on each side of the sink helping to carry that load, right? And it'll transfer it over because it's really strong porcelain. So what I got to do now, I'm going to just get a couple more measurements before I go to grind. 24 three quarters. And then over here is the same. Good. So I'm going to trace my line. And of course the face of the trim needs a one and an eighth piece. So I'm going to mark that on here as well. All the cut lines will go on the back wall. 
and then I'll bring my backsplash tile down to it. Now for everybody who isn't sure, Jeff, you're crazy. You're using such a huge tile. <laughs> How in the world are you gonna cut 30 inch tile? It's too big for the wet saw. And I'm gonna show you a technique with your grinder because I don't expect everybody to go out and spend a thousand dollars on a scratch tool for this size of tile. Try to get an inch and an eighth on a scratch tool. Good luck, it's not gonna work. And we don't wanna be throwing any of this in the garbage. We wanna use this stuff, right? So let's just be careful. I'm gonna show you my technique with my hand grinder where you can get a perfectly nice finished cut and you're gonna be real happy with it. And it's a professional look, okay? It's not a cheesy way to do this. Just gotta be patient. We're gonna cut a couple of stones on camera for you so you can get a feel for how easy this is. Now I know that takes a few minutes, but now I've got four of the eight cuts that I have to make for the whole countertop. I think it's worth it. Um, invest in a grinder and a blade because this is a tool you can use over and over again, where if you're gonna buy a scratch tool to do this, you run the risk of it not breaking nice and needing to go back to the store for more tile, or you're gonna need to buy a $2,000 wet saw, right? Keep it simple and just take an extra few minutes to get the job done perfect every time. Right over to the, right over to the sink. Okay, and then we'll just make an adjustment here to nice and nice. I still hear buzzing in the room. <laughs> so I'm just taking the time to dry fit everything. Uh, turns out that this edge here is just a hair long right on the corner. So I'm gonna grind that back. Wonderful thing about that tool is I can make modifications like that real easy. Now, I'm just gonna take a piece of paper here. Let's get the last couple measurements. Five, five, by. Should be 24. Okay, and then I need a piece across the front, and then this front, and then one in the back. And I want to go up to just in front of where the faucet goes on this one. Two inch, give a nice support across the back. Okay, this should be the same dimension, 22 and a quarter. Yep. And then the same on the front here. So that's by one and an eighth on the front. This one, we have a metal bracket right there, right? That's just sitting inside the lip. So I'm gonna measure from the lip. I'm gonna three and a half shy. So that's one, two, three, and then four more. That's my side. Okay. Whew. All right, let's do this. So we're just gonna get it all in place. Good. And this is the one to the right over here. Ah. Now time to make some thin set. Uh, today I'm gonna to use Ultralight. Ultralight um, is a fabulous product because it dries relatively quick. Gives you a really superior bond. In this particular case, what it does is it, it really peaks up. So I'm allowed to lay all my stone, and I can use a rubber mallet on, on a large tile like this to just gently tap the corners where I wanna have everything perfectly flush. Could use um, leveling clips. But in the hurry to get this video made, I didn't bring them with me. So I don't even, I don't know if I have any in storage. I'm not gonna waste my time. I literally have three joints. So I think I'm just gonna rely on my experience, but you could use the Levin Clip system if you wanted to. Well, we have that in other videos if you need to check that out. Here's my secret to mixing thin set so you don't get filthy dirty, okay? Here you go. Make sure you always put water in the pail first. Read the instructions on the back. It gives you the mixture levels, all right? Have a good mixing blade. Add your cement into the water. Always, if you put in the cement in first and then mix, you're gonna have all kinds of dry corners and messes. Get a slow mixer, something like this from DeWalt will work great. Lock your truck on. Go slowly. If it does this with the peak, it's ready. But this is ultralight. This particular product needs to be whipped until it's more like whipped cream that you'd put on your pie. That's not enough, it's too dry. So you're gonna add a little bit more water. Be careful, this reacts a lot like pancake batter. Now 
There you go. Now you let it sit for about 10 minutes before you use it. And you'll always stay nice and clean if you only make half a pail at a time. So, here we are. So now that my thin set is set up, okay, it's got a little bit of stiffness to it. I trowel it and it's gonna hold the line. That's what you wanna see, okay? So we're gonna get some cement on the counter. We're gonna trowel the counter in. We're going to back butter our tiles as we go. We're gonna get an incredible bond and we're gonna make this place look spectacular in about 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. You wanna just keep material on there, set it to your edge, press it down and then rake it away. All right. We'll do this over and over and over again. It's always easier to put the right amount of thin set in there knowing the ridges will collapse so that it finishes flush, okay? If you put too much in, then you're gonna be in war trying to force that thin set out as you pound on it with a rubber mallet. Increases the likelihood that you're gonna break a tile. So what we're gonna do, is we're gonna try it with this trowel first. This is a one quarter by three eighths by one quarter, which basically means quarter inch wide, three eighths deep, quarter inch wide. And I'm gonna try to leave enough thin set there and trowel on that angle consistently. So every ridge is about the same. And because I'm using this transition on top of the countertop, I'm automatically gonna be higher all around the perimeter. And that's okay because it's easy to squish out at the perimeter because it can go out and up through the, my grout line. All right, so this is actually not a problem. This is a good thing. All right, now, large format tile. You wanna comb all of the thin set in one direction. The industry has a term for it. Guess what? That's gonna blow your mind. It's called directional troweling. I know. Woo! As long as you use fancy words like that when you're telling people what you did, they will think you are a genius and know what you're doing. If all you gotta do in this world is say, I do is directional troweling and back butter when I tile, and uh, <laughs> everyone will think you're an expert. Here we go. I mean, it works for everybody on TV, right? Okay, time to butter my toast, see? Eh? It's funny, they all say the same thing, back butter, but then no one shows you that they know how to do it. The secret here is really fill in the texture of the tile on the back with a thin layer of thin set so that everything in the directional when you collapse the ridges has something to bond to. Uh, what we're gonna do is just set it and forget it. Boom. Right now my tile is a little raised. What I'm gonna do, just give it enough love that it comes flush with my metal top. Perfect. Now, this is the perfect time to wipe it all off. Make sure you don't have any thin set on there. Pencil lines, whatever else have you. Here comes your first trick when you're tiling. You take your carpenter pencil and you sharpen the edge nice and thin and flat to the size of your grout line. And you can get rid of all the extra cement that would otherwise be in your grout space, okay? And then when you're done, your tile job, there's no grout to chisel out. Piece of cake. I'm gonna do the entire top and then set the sink in right away. As you can tell, a lot of sinks when they're surface mount, they have bracket lines like this. This has to be on the interior of the cut-in of the Formica so that you can put in the locking mechanisms. I am setting a little piece of stone on each side of where the faucet mount is with a big glob of cement, okay? And when I set the sink in, I'm gonna let that level that, okay? Same with the back. This is the piece that goes along the back of this counter. I'm gonna just kind of flatten out. I'm gonna go excessive here, okay? It's easier for me to fix this when I drop the sink in. I'm going to try to do a little bit of a directional troweling, but you can see how difficult this is gonna be, right? So you're gonna have a hell of a time trying to do a good job here. Sometimes, what I would recommend is do the directional troweling on your tile, back butter the counter. Instead, 
do a combination of both. Doesn't really matter, as long as you get the height right. So we're gonna set the next couple of pieces in, get the next big tile in, drop it in the sink, give everything a bit of a wiggle to make sure it's in the right spot, and then we'll be okay. <clears throat> Mucho bueno. Okay, so what we're gonna do is a technique here. I'm gonna slide the trowel down and slowly leave a ridge of cement behind. And this is the point in the video where everybody's like, I wonder why he is using ultralight. And it's this. Ultralight carries 40 pounds per square foot on a ceiling. And in this scenario, if you put it on nice and thick like this, you can recess it in the hole and then press and squeeze the extra cement out right until it's flush. And you don't need to add any tape or anything else to set this up. Just get it flush. You can use your pencil. Clean out your grout line. There's no fussing around tomorrow when we come and grout. There, done. I'm just going to stick the next few pieces in. You might have noticed that in behind me I moved some electrical. Um, we're going to have a short little video that you can watch at the end of this one, all right? And it'll explain to you how you can make modifications last minute on your job, if it's your house, with your electrical. And how you can call the Electrical Safety Authority to come and do an inspection. And a couple of tips on there, so that you can get it done quick in a hurry and won't delay your project. Because I just wasn't happy with where the electrical was, and I thought I'd bring it up to code while I was at it. So click the link right there, and we'll see you in the next video. Cheers.